All right, everyone, our last lecture video of the whole semester is going to be on quick sort and how to sort without comparison. So this this unit has been quick, but all a little bit about how to break the rules. So we looked at quick select where the worst case analysis doesn't really hold, tell the whole story, where the worst case analysis of quick select to find the median, the worst case is really bad. So the worst case is like n squared, but the average case turns out to match the best case. And then if we randomize it, then, then it's the same as the expected case analysis of uh, linear time. So it's expected runtime is linear, but the worst case is uh, n squared. And this one is the one that really matters. There's a way that we can get um, big O of n worst case time, but it's not, it's not actually practical to do that. Um, the fastest way to do quick selection is to pick a random pivot. And so now we're going to see how we can extend that idea to sorting with quick sort, and then how we can break the comparisons rule um, for the very last thing. Okay, so here's quick sort. You'll notice that uh, it's basically the same thing as quick select, where we pick a pivot element, then we partition based on that pivot element, and then, um, then we have some recursion. The difference is that we have two recursive calls now instead of just one recursive call. So let me show you like a little bit what that looks like pictorially. So let's say with quick select, so quick select I'm going to do first here. Let's say we're looking for like this element from the array. So this is our k value. We're trying to say the kth smallest thing. And so what are we going to do with quick select is we pick a random pivot. So maybe the first pivot we select is this one right here. So we're going to partition everything according to that element and put that in its place, and then we only recurse on one side. So everything on this side is larger than that green one, but we ignore that, and now we recurse on this part right here. Okay, so now I pick another random pivot, maybe the second random pivot is somewhere around here. Okay, so now I'm gonna discard everything in between my first two pivots and focus just on this part. Then my next random pivot might be somewhere right here, so now I'm not gonna ignore all that. And what you can see is you're kind of like narrowing down onto the location that you really care about until at some point you find it. Okay, so you kind of um, narrow down on that one spot. And as a side effect, all of these green positions now, all the pivot elements that I chose, those are actually in their correct sorted order. And, um, and, and everything in between them actually goes in between them. So if I do a quick select, I've actually somewhat ordered the array but I, it's more tightly ordered around the thing that I was looking for, around the k, k element that I was searching for. And like these big um, subarrays back here are entirely unsorted. We just know that they're between those two endpoints. But then this lends itself well to how can I, um, how can I do a complete sorting algorithm is I might start, so if I pick the same initial pivot, I will do the same thing, but now I'm gonna recurse on both sides. So with, with quick sort is going to be down here. I kind of initially choose that one pivot and organize everything, partition everything according to both sides of that. And then I'm going to have two recursive calls. So I'm going to recursively sort the left-hand side and recursively sort the right-hand side. And so what will happen there is um, I'll just keep choosing more recursive pivots and on smaller and smaller arrays, maybe like this and like this. And you know, so the next level down, I have a lot of recursive calls, but all on a much smaller array. And then at some point you have that whole portion sorted. Um, and right, so it's just recursively choosing pivots in all these parts until it's sorting the whole thing. So rather than kind of sorting just around that kth element, we end up um, having a completely sorted array where eventually everything has been chosen as a pivot or at least uh, half of the things, because you, if you have a gap of one, then you don't bother even selecting a pivot. You just say, I have one element, it's already sorted. So quick sort is gonna do the same thing as quick select, but by having two recursive calls, it's gonna um, kind of narrow down on every position in the array, not just on that one position. So it ends up ordering the whole thing. And as we've learned before, the difference in algorithm between having two recursive calls and one recursive call can make a big difference. Um, so in the best case, what do we have for quick sort is the best case recurrence is something like t of n equals n. So that's for the partition. 
the initial splitting into the left or right plus um, 2 times t of n over 2. So if we are lucky enough to select the best possible pivot right in the middle, then this is going to come down to just big theta of n log n, which we know is the optimal for any comparison-based sorting, so that sounds pretty good. But in the worst case, what can happen is if we select an unlucky pivot, then we still spend n amount of time to do the partition, but now we're going to have like one side is almost empty, or maybe it's completely empty, and the other side has n minus 1 things in it. So it would be like n plus t of n minus 1. That comes out to be, if you um, think of your master methods, this is the same as the recurrence for selection sort. That comes out to be n squared. So the worst case of quick sort is actually the same thing as the worst case of quick select, it's, and for the same reason. Um, but the best case is not as good as the best case for quick select. Um, the best we can do for quick sort is still n log n. And now in practice, you could ensure that the partition, the pivot element is always optimal by using your quick select algorithm to select the median. But in practice, that's kind of overkill because quick select is already kind of doing part of the work of sorting. Um, so we want to figure out, well, what happens if we just like choose a random pivot or whatever? And, and so that's what this analysis is showing. This is like the full recurrence with the whole summation over all the possible pivot choices. It gets to be a complicated thing. You, you can do it. Uh, you can look in a textbook. Um, but it's more complicated than what we need. And what we want to consider instead is the depth of the recursion. So how many levels down, how many times do you have to recursively split up the array? Um, so that can be called the height. So that's going to be, uh, so I call it a D and I call it H. Um, I don't know, I guess I'll stick with H. So the height of the recursion is now the max of the height of the left-hand side and the height of the right-hand side. This is again a complicated like summation of a recurrence. We don't have any good way to deal with that. But we can simplify it like before with the good pivot, bad pivot thing. Um, so then using expected case, what we can say is that, okay, the height is always going to be 1 plus because we're thinking about the top level and then the next level's down. And then if we have a bad pivot, that means that in at most the subtree is going to have still height, this, the same height. So 1 half times h of n. So in, in a bad pivot case, you don't really get to save much. But in the good pivot case, um, you get to cut out at least one fourth. So remember, we said a good pivot is one that's like in the middle half of the array. So with one half probability, we get to cut out a fourth. So we get like three n over four here. And so now what does this work out to be? Well, we have an h of n on both sides. So we can solve that, subtract that from both sides. We get one half h of n equals one plus one half times h of 3n over 4. And now I'll multiply everything by 2 to get rid of this 1 half. And now I have a recurrence that looks kind of maybe more comfortable for us. 2 plus h of 3 fourths times n. And now we can actually use master method A. This is not, you know, we've seen for binary search, it's like 1 plus h of n over 2. Um, but it turns out that any fraction here that's less than 1, if you plug that into master method A, and I encourage you to practice this yourself, this just comes about to be big theta of log n. And so what that means is that the height of the recursion on average is log n, and so the total cost is on average n log n, because you have to do n amount of work at every recursive level. So that's, that's kind of what we wanted to say. Um, so the average case cost of just choosing an arbitrary element as a pivot is n log n. But we said, remember, average case depends on the idea that you're getting a randomly ordered uh, original input array, which is not a valid assumption. And it's much better to use a randomized strategy where we com control this. So the difference between expected and average case is that with expected case, it's about the random choices that we control as opposed to assuming something about the input distribution. So then that is the same thing. It comes out to be n log n. Of course, we could use this, but this is going to be bad in practice. Um, we could use this more complicated median of median algorithms, um, which is cool to say that that works like that in the worst case. But it's actually not even that interesting. So with quick select, it's interesting that there is a worst case um, 
linear time algorithm for selection because we don't know any other way to do it. But for sorting, of course, we do know other ways of getting an n log n worst case sorting algorithm like merge sort or heap sort. Um, so I would say like this idea in quicksort is kind of pretty useless. What's interesting is that we can get the same asymptotic performance as merge sort, but it turns out that quicksort tends to be a bit faster in practice. And so this is one of the sorting algorithms which is used very commonly in, in some applications. Okay, so the other sorting thing I wanted to talk about is how to break this comparison assumption. So far, all the sorting algorithms we've looked at, like quick sort, merge sort, heap sort, the fastest ones are all n log n time. And we proved that like basically that's the best possible. Any comparison-based sorting algorithm has to spend at least n log n time. But wait, how do we know that comparisons are required? Right? Who says that we can do that? Well, um, that we can view this as a negative result, but we can also use it as a guide. So anytime there's an impossibility result in like computing or mathematics, it's always saying, under this assumption, this thing is impossible. So you can view that as like, okay, I can't do this. Another way to view that is this shines a spotlight on what we need to do in order to improve. So how would we possibly improve on um, the running time of like heap sort, merge sort, and quick sort is we have to not base our, so we don't base the ordering on comparisons. And what does that mean? Well, it wasn't maybe immediately obvious what that could mean, um, but what it, what it really means in practice is that we have to use the actual um, like numerical values of the items that we're sorting. So this is not going to work in general for like strings or for uh, if you were sorting people based on some uh, weird criterion or something. You know, the general sorting problem is is just that you can do comparisons. But if we're like sorting numbers or something has a little bit better um, properties and we can use those numerical values, then we can do sorting faster. And so the, the general idea here is what's called bucket sort. It's not really a specific algorithm, but it's what it's saying is that um, if I know that the items, if I can organize them into like a small number of groups or buckets, then I go through and like put each thing into its group. And then I might recursively do that. So for example, a good example I would think of is um, thinking about sorting uh, cards, a deck of cards. What might you do first is go through the whole deck and organize it by suit. So there's four suits. You know that in the final sorted order of the cards, you want all the suits to be together. So just start out by putting everything into its own suit. And then, so that each suit there is like a bucket. So within the bucket, it's not sorted, but I know that I have all the spades together, all the hearts together, all the clubs, whatever. And then I can pick up each one of those now smaller piles and I could maybe organize them by, you know, the, I could do like ace through five, then six through 10, and then jack through king. You know, so now I've organized into like three sub buckets and, and, and like that, that tends to be actually a fast way when I, um, grade your final exams, I'm going to have a big stack of pieces of paper and I'm going to need to organize that to sort it to put it into the grade book. I usually find the fastest way to do that is to um, organize things by last name. So make like four or five piles based on the ranges of last names and then uh, recursively now I have a bunch of five smaller piles which are maybe easier to just kind of organize by hand. Um, and so bucket sort is kind of this general idea. And the question is, how do we make the buckets? How do we organize that? So the first specific example um, is something called counting sort. And the idea is we first count and then we sort based on the counts. And so it's going to be only working under this assumption. So this is written in mathematical notation. But the assumption is that every element that I'm sorting, everything in the array is between 0 and k minus 1. So we're sorting relatively small integers. And if we do that, then we can just count how many of each number occurs and then kind of put them directly where they go. We don't ever have to compare them because we're, we're counting them in a separate array. So let me show you an example of this. Um, here's a, an array. What you should notice is that here k equals 5. Um, so everything is between 0 and k minus 1. So I can say k equals 5 in this case. Okay, now how am I going to sort this? First I count. So uh, the counts are going to be just going through the array and saying how many zeros, how many ones, etc. So there are, looks like four zeros, 
and three ones and one two and there's no threes and there's two fours so this is the counts um for three four zeros three ones one two no threes and two fours and this should all add up to 10 which is the original length of the array okay so i'm just counting how many times each each number occurs then in the way that I just described the algorithm, I figure out the positions. That's just like the sum of where each, the sum of the counts, the running sum of the counts to know where each number goes. So like the first zero is gonna go in position zero. That's kind of straightforward, but then the first one will go in position four. And then the first two will go in position seven because there's four zeros and three ones. So the first two will go in position seven. The first three will go in position eight. There aren't any threes, but that's still kind of how that works. So that means the first four also goes in position eight. So what I'm doing with this positions array is like um, the first position for each number. It's, it's just adding up the previous element in the position array plus the next element of the count array. So four plus three is seven, seven plus one is eight, eight plus zero is eight, and then the final one, we don't have to say what's the end of it, but it, it should count out to the length of the original array, which is 10. And now what we do is uh, just go through, update the positions array as we, as we go and, um, and, and write everything out. So now the output array is, I'm going to start with the zeros. I'm sorry, I'm going to go through this original array and put each thing where it goes. So I see a four to start out with. So I put the four in the first position. So let me make, I have to make an empty array. Three, four, five, six, seven, ten. Okay, so I have an empty array and I'm gonna put each thing where it goes. So um, four is gonna go in the position of the first four, which is index eight. So I'm gonna put a four right there and I'm gonna update this. Now the next four will go in position nine. Okay, so that's good. And then I see a zero next. Um, I see the first zero goes in position zero, so I'm gonna put a zero right here. And I'll update this position to one. So every time I'm placing something, so this next two will go in position seven right here. And then I'll update this to eight. And as soon as it gets updated to the following monitor, that means that that's the last of those that I'll ever see. Um, so the one will go in position four, which is right here. Oh, sorry, so that's gonna be a one. And I update this to five now. So I'm updating the positions as I go. I see another one. So I'm gonna update the next position to six and put the next one in index five. I see a zero, so that's gonna go in index one. And so what you should notice is that um, because I'm updating the positions as I go, and based on the counts of where they are, by the time I get to the end, so the next one will go right here. Um, I put a five here, but it should have been one, excuse me. Um, so that was index five, but is the value one would have gotten copied there from this spot. And let's see, so that updates this index to seven. So it's like, I know where everything belongs because I've already counted up where they should go. Um, the next four is gonna go in position nine. So this will get updated to 10 and I'll put a four back here. And then the two zeros are gonna fill in those two spots right there. So by counting everything first in this separate array, I get to know exactly where everything belongs. And then this last step is just kind of placing things where they go. So that's called counting sort. It's, um, well, we can think about how fast it is, but the important thing is to recognize that it doesn't work for any array. It only works for an array where the um, we're sorting integers that are relatively small. And so what's the running time? Well, I have three loops here. I have to first make the array of counts. That costs n time, because I have to go through the array A and update the counts. Then I have to make the positions, which is, uh, which is k time because that's how big how many different um, numbers there are and then I have to update everything which is another big O of n loop so the total cost in terms of running time ends up being big theta of 
n plus k, where k is uh, how big are the numbers in my array, and n is how big is the array itself. So if k is smaller than n, if I have a big array that only has like numbers from 1 up to 10, then this is linear time. That's great. But if I have a small array that has big numbers in it, this is going to be really slow. And what's the space that gets used is the same. Um, because I have to have an extra array in order to copy the things at the end, and I have to have two size k arrays for the counts and the positions. So we have the same running time and space. And the important thing here is that if k is small, so if k is small, then uh, this is linear time. So if k is small, so if I'm sorting an array of small numbers, then this can beat uh, merge sort or anything else. So this is the first example of a sorting algorithm that we've seen, which works correctly to sort and which might be better than n log n, but only in the special case of sorting small numbers. And it's also a stable sort. So we actually talked about this before. Stable just means that um, if I have two zeros in the original array, they end up in the same order after I sort them. And so counting sort is stable. And that stability lets us extend this idea to what's called radix sort, where you're kind of sorting digit by digit. Um, so let me just show you an example here. If I'm sorting some numbers like um, 236 and 137 and 258 and 119 and uh, 0, 0, uh, 009. Then what this does is start with the least significant digit and it's going to organize based on that first. Um, so you can actually see First, it's going to look at this digit. So it's actually already ordered in terms of that digit. OK, so that's fine. So, But that's not sorted. Uh, then we move on and we look at this digit. And here now, it's not ordered yet. So the first one is going to be 009. And then it'll be 119. And then 236. Then 137. And then 258. So that's kind of sorting. Now it's sort organized first based on the last column, then based on the second column. And now I'm going to sort it based on the first digit. Um, and what's important is that we have a stable sort. So things like the 236 is before 258 here. So even though they have the same first digit, they're going to remain in the same order in the final one. So uh, in terms of the first digit, 009 is still first, then 119. So then all the ones, so 137 will be next. And then all the twos, so 236 and 258. And now this is the actual complete sorted order of those five numbers. So what it's really doing is just doing a counting sort one digit at a time. And because counting sort is a stable sorting algorithm that's not going to change the relative order of things, then uh, the whole thing ends up being stable, which is great. That's what we wanted. OK, so. Um, we end up, you can think of this as kind of like if you were sorting an Excel spreadsheet where you want it to be organized by last name primarily and then within first name, you would first sort it based on the first name and then sort it based on the last name. So you kind of do the most important thing last. Um, there's a way that you can also think of radix sort starting with the most significant digit, but that's not what we're talking about. This is a least significant digit radix sort. And the analysis now is going to depend on the base and the number of digits and, uh, and how long the array is. So if we assume that the base is constant, so here like this is base 10, in practice in a computer it might be base 2. Um, so assume the base is big O of 1 is a constant, then the total cost here is, well, there's going to be d steps. And within each step, I just have to do a counting sort, which is um, n time. So it's d times n. And so what that means, so d is the number of digits in every value. Number of base b digits. So again, if we have small numbers, then this is going to be fast. And this is, this is kind of extending a little bit beyond counting sort. So if now it's not just uh, the actual values of the numbers themselves, but the number of digits. If the number of digits in your values is relatively small, then this ends up being sometimes faster than n log n. 
So just as a summary, uh, here's all these sorting algorithms that we've looked at. Um, this should be n plus b, uh, according to what we just wrote. So this k in radix from counting sort ends up being the base b. And uh, the last thing to say is that in place and stable is kind of hard to both, both achieve. So for radix sort, you can have one or the other, but not both. Um, What's interesting is that radix sort itself is in place, but it depends on counting sort, which is not in place. So really, it's not going to be in place. Um, and there's a, it's an interesting observation that it seems to be hard to get an algorithm that's fast and in place and stable. There's some that technically do this, but they're not really practical. Um, okay, so that was a little bit of, of how to break the rules. Uh, so we just looked at counting sort and radix sort as a way of saying, if we don't have to worry about being in this comparison model, then we can use the actual values of the numbers we're sorting, and we can beat n log n time. And that's all I wanted to say about sorting. I hope you enjoyed this whole set of videos for the whole semester, and I'll see you next class.